So I, I decided the other day to go to Costco, the day after the governor's order. And we're blessed here in Pocatello. Not a lot of lines in a lot of places. And I think folks are being, being pretty good. But March, uh, Wednesday, the 25th of March, the, uh, Brad Little gave a, Governor Little gave an announcement, a stay-at-home order. And I said, hey, I think, I think there's a few things that I haven't picked up yet that might be good now that he's extended it for a number of weeks. So I decided to go. And it was pretty good. I get there just a few minutes before Costco opens, and, you know, there's not many people there. And I thought, this is great. And then a guy opens the door, and he says, oh, this door is for the pharmacy. And so, uh, okay. And then we kind of go. There's like 20 of us kind of standing there, very carefully, social distanced apart. And, uh, and we say, well, where's the other line? Oh, it's over there. And we kinda, so we kind of go and lean over and look over in the other way. And there's a line that runs the whole length of the whole building and then comes back and then makes a turn. And it's like, uh, it's like an amusement park. It's all over the place. And it reminded me of a story because on the, on the and I got in there, people actually made some new friends and it was great. Um, but, it's, uh, but it was interesting because on the door also showed there were special early hours for uh, seniors, for the most vulnerable among us. So for older uh, Americans, for senior citizens, uh, there was a special time. There's an hour or two that you could come early, and, uh, and then you get, they get to come in. So the story that I heard was there's a long line, and so it was all seniors because they got to go in early and get first pick of things and be able to be safe and you know, be careful from others. And as we're lined up in this long line, um, along comes, you know, um, somebody gets out of his car, and the, all these seniors, and it's long. I mean, there's hundreds of people in this line. And it's a young man. He's like 25. And he's kind of, it almost looks like he's kind of furtively or kind of sneaking, almost like he's embarrassed. And he cut, he's cutting. He's cutting the line. And so he goes up. And as they, people could see, he's kind of sneaking up there and going to try to sneak into the front of the line. Well, the senior citizens, you know, because almost, uh, and, you know, because they say anything that they want to say, and so they're giving him grief. You know, what do you, who do you think you are, and why are you doing this? And you're not, you're not over 60 years old, or you're not over 65, or whatever it is. You're just a young kid. You must be in your 20s, and they're, they're heaping insults, and, and, and they say, we're going to call somebody, and you can't be there. What do you think you're doing? Finally, he stops, turns to the line, and he says, folks, listen. If I don't unlock the doors, none of you will be able to get in. And so it immediately, of course, everyone hushes and they're embarrassed because what he's done is a classic move. He's turned the tables. He's turned the tables on what their expectation was. And almost all great stories have something like that, where you turn the tables on the audience. It can be a Marvel movie or Star Wars or it could be Lord of the Rings or Narnia or even movies like Men in Black or Field of Dreams or, or Rudy. There's a, a turning of the table. And so this, where Pastor Von Bush talked about Palm Sunday setting the table, this part is now a turning the tables. And it's a little tongue-in-cheek. There's some literal elements of this, but then there are some more important pieces also. So I did a little study on this because I wanted to know where did that phrase come from? And I was pretty sure that I had it figured out because it just seems very obvious to any student of the Bible. We know all about tables being turned. Um, but so I look it up because I wanted to see what it formally said. And I look at dozens and dozens of websites and almost all of them say the origin of this idiom, turning the tables, comes from the 17th century in the 1600s and it relates to board games, backgammon, chess, checkers, those kinds of games, where if you were desperately losing, turning the tables was as if you could just shift the board, and then now you went from losing to winning, or vice versa. So the idea was you turned the tables by shifting your position on the board from losing to winning. And I thought to myself, I, looked, I look and I look at dozens of these things and I go, well, this is just stupid. Board games, this is your great meaning. Board games, backgammon gives us the meaning of turning the tables. And that's baloney because there's a, an, uh, this verbal phrase we're very familiar with and we know exactly where it comes from because it comes from the very next day after the cheering fades on Sunday Jesus went to church on Monday. 
Let me read the reading for you. So if you want to follow along on the reading, this one is from Matthew chapter 21. Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, My house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did, and the children shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. Do you hear what these children are saying, they asked him? Yes, replied Jesus. Have you never read? From the lips of children and infants, you, Lord, have called forth your praise. And he left them and went out of the city to Bethany, where he spent the night. Some of the more pointed and more direct claims to divinity that Jesus makes, because he welcomes those praises and worship as if they were given to the Lord Almighty. And so now, for a second time, Jesus comes and turns the tables. John records us the casting out of the money changers who were ripping people off and charging people too much. They had a big scam going. Jesus record, John records it for us in the first year of Jesus' ministry. And then here in the third and final year of Jesus' ministry, Matthew and Mark and Luke record it for us that on Monday of Holy Week, Jesus turns the tables. And so literally, Jesus does this, but it also sets the table for us on how Jesus will turn the tables in a far greater way in just four days. Now, let's be honest with one another. We're in a moment. Sometimes the news is too much, isn't it? There's too many outlets. There's too much coming our way. The governor's site and the State Department of Health and the CDC and the news networks, and cable news, and on the internet, and blogs, and posts, and on and on and on. We need some tables turned right now, don't we? We're longing for some tables to be turned, for some change to happen. Whether you're afraid of a virus, or you have loved ones who are sick, or maybe they're in a hot spot. Our pastor Settlemeyer from Emmanuel Twin Falls told us about his son, who's in Indianapolis, who, is, who, has been, who has been called out of anesthesiology up to the ER. And so he's got one mask, and they pray for him constantly that he would be able to be safe, but also be able to serve. And he's in Indianapolis, not in New York, not in Seattle, uh, not in Italy or Spain. So you may have the fears of the virus or those you love. Maybe your job has been lost, or maybe it's on the verge. Maybe you own a small business. And you don't know if you'll have access to these funds. Or you don't know how you're going to make it past this and your employees even less. Or paying a mortgage or the list of bills. Maybe your, your, your sense of isolation is even greater than it was before we began. And too often it seems that the onslaught of the media wants to serve itself with sensationalism and politicizing every moment instead of bringing information and encouragement and hope. But there's more than that, because there's fear, and there's doubt, and anxiety, there's exhaustion, there's stress, as we deal with new situations in new ways, in ways we've never done before. So Jesus, you should know, Jesus is longing to turn the tables for us. Beginning with Palm Sunday, With cheering and exaltation, Jesus is now turning the tables on the religious leaders of the day. It continues here in the temple, and now his enemies get serious. It appears that the whole world is going after Jesus. What an irony that here in the midst of an empty sanctuary, almost empty, sorry guys, in an almost empty sanctuary, there are more people tuned in to hearing the gospel message of Jesus Christ than we have been able to record in, in the last number of years. The whole world, we pray, is going after Jesus. So, watch now how Jesus begins to turn table after table after table. Jesus heads to the temple to worship, and he ends up running them out on a rail, instigating a riot. Jesus welcomes the cheers of the crowd, 
But those same cheers and voices cry crucify in just a few days. Jesus walks on the coats and the palms of a victorious king laid upon the ground to honor him. And then he himself kneels and washes his disciples' feet. Jesus, in just a matter of two days, will pray what we know as his high priestly prayer on behalf of believers then and believers today and in all time. And yet, none of his disciples, and I dare say we would fare no better, cannot stay awake with him for an hour as he is in agony in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus is the embodiment, the fulfillment of prophecy of the one who would begin and rule over a reign of justice for all people. But a miscarriage of justice is about to be placed upon him. Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And yet, he will be executed as a common criminal, mocked and rejected. Jesus is perfection in the flesh, sinless, the perfect Lamb of God, and yet, on this Friday, will become sin, hated, despised by all who see Him, and in fact, abandoned by His Father, utterly alone. In fact, in that moment, the en- our great enemy and the enemies of Jesus Christ imagine that the tables have now been turned on Him, And yet we go back, if there's a second reading here, from Matthew 16, back in the midpoint of Jesus' ministry. And I'll summarize it a little. You see it printed here before you on the screen, and you may have printed it out for you. But in Matthew chapter 16, let me paraphrase a little. Jesus takes them to Caesarea Philippi, asks his disciples, what's the word on the street? Who do people say that I am? And they answer, John the Baptist, Elijah, one of the prophets. That's amazing. But Jesus says, but what about you? How discerning are you? What have you learned? Who do you say I am? And Peter, on behalf of all those disciples, says, you are the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus cheers. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. Flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father which is in heaven. And I'm going to give you a new name. We're going to call you rock, and on this rock of faith, we're going to build the church, and even hell can't stand against it. And so that faith that people confess, that's the church, and even hell cannot defeat it. And then immediately upon that, Jesus says, now let me tell you what it means. You've told, you've answered rightly. I am the Messiah, the Christ, the promised one. Let me tell you what that means. I'll be handed over to the chief priests. I will suffer. I will be crucified and on the third day rise again. And you can just imagine Peter, who's now, you know, kind of probably fairly full of himself because Jesus has honored him, and now is kind of seeing himself as a leader of disciples, probably hears that and says to Jesus, "Uh, Jesus, a word, please. Pulls him off to the side. And he says, now, Jesus, you know, we're simpatico, you and me. I think I get the picture here. You You can't be saying that. You can't be saying that. You just said that you're the son of the living God. You affirmed that. You're the Messiah. You're the chosen one. What, what, what's this dying thing, this, this crucified thing? And Jesus turns the tables on Peter and on any who would limit his mission or define his mission in our terms. Jesus says the harshest words that could be said, get behind me, Satan. Satan. You do not have in mind the things of God. You have in mind the things of men. You just think like we think, like men think. And Jesus says, I think like God thinks because I am God come to save. And so we go back to Peter's confession, turning the tables again, where Peter says, no way, Jesus. Or when he comes to the foot washing, Peter again, no way, Jesus. And Jesus says, this is the only way. God's way. For if Jesus Christ does not turn the tables for us, they are not turned. They remain. Our sin remains. Our fears remain. Our hope is lost. But Jesus Christ, as we celebrate this week, as we observe, as we remember, 
He is absolutely, fully, completely ready and prepared to turn those tables for us now. In these days to come, in fears and anxiety and isolation, there is nothing that can prevent the events to come. People are talking about celebrating Easter on another day. We won't do it because Easter comes regardless of our circumstances and gives us a powerful message of hope we must cling to. God forbid that we would allow the circumstances of the moment to somehow seem to think that we have to shift the celebration of Easter. Easter comes exactly when we need it, in the darkest of moments, in the greatest hour of our need. Easter comes. Easter will be celebrated by his people. For nothing can prevent us or separate us from the love of God in Christ. Jesus will go on doing what he has come to do on our behalf. He will go to the cross. He will suffer on our behalf. And he will rise again. And so in this moment, in this moment where we see evidence of selfishness, empty shelves, ignoring wise counsel of those that are set in authority over us, breathless gossip and the sharing of rumors, it's kind of a time of every man for himself in far too many ways. Jesus will turn those tables one more time. For Jesus is the one, the one man who dies for every man. The selfless one who turns the tables on sin and death and our greatest enemies now and always. Here comes King Jesus marching in triumph, marching to the cross victorious. We welcome the King. Lord Jesus, we praise you on this Palm Sunday as we celebrate your entrance, not just into Jerusalem, but into our lives and hearts. We long for you, Jesus. We need you. There is no other who can save us. And so, Lord, receive our prayers, our praise, our worship. Renew us, restore us, and help us, Lord, to fix our eyes on you as you have fixed your eyes upon us, never leaving us, never abandoning us. To you, Lord Jesus, all glory and praise and thanks. It's in your name we pray. Amen.